This is the Alkazine Brief on UK Health Radio, your real feel-good radio with Peter Hofflin. New Orleans. Without a doubt, New Orleans is a one-of-a-kind destination, famous for its vibrant culture, music, food, all reflecting the city's unique history of French, Spanish, African and American culture. But the city is also known for its many events, from sports to business and, of course, medical education. And with this unique environment in mind, last December, New Orleans was the host city of the American Society of Hematology. This annual event brought together tens of thousands of participants from across the world to present and discuss the results of studies that ranged from initial hypothesis to practice-changing results. In this episode of The Young in Brief, I talk with two experts about their research and the impact the outcomes from these studies may have on the treatment of patients diagnosed with cancer. First, I talk with Dr. Christopher Heary. Dr. Heary is a board-certified medical oncologist with primary expertise in translational and clinical development of immunotherapies, including, but let me emphasize, not limited to pdl one inhibitors, therapeutic cancer vaccines, immune suppressor modulators, adoptive NK cells, and other therapeutics. As Chief Medical Officer of Arcelix, he is responsible for medical oversight, clinical strategy, and medical affairs, and regulatory strategy for the company's pipeline of novel investigational drugs. In the second half of the program, I'm talking with Dr. Serdan Verstafsek. Dr. Verstafsek is a medical oncologist and professor in the Department of Leukemia at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. We talk about some developments in the treatment of myeloproliferative neoplasms. This type of cancer begins with an abnormal mutation or change in a stem cell in the bone marrow. These changes lead to an overproduction of any combination of white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets, and result in a number of diseases, including essential thrombocytemia, or ET, a rare blood disease in which the bone marrow produces too much platelets, myelofibrosis, a rare disorder in which abnormal blood cells and fibers built up in the bone marrow, and polycythemia vera, a disease in which too many red blood cells are made in the bone marrow and, in many cases, the number of white blood cells and platelets are also elevated. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngest in Brief. The Youngest in Brief is developed in collaboration with our online journal Oncozine, that is O-N-C-O-Z-I-N-E, where you can find additional information and the latest news about cancer diagnosis and treatment and cancer prevention. For more information on how to support this program, visit our website at Oncozine, that is O-N-C-O-Z-I-N-E dot com. And if you're living in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, text the word CANCER to 66866. And we will make sure that you'll receive our newsletter, which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. This is the Oncozine Brief. For the latest news about cancer and cancer treatment, visit our online journal, Oncozine, at www.oncozine.com. On the phone with me is Dr. Christopher Heary, the Chief Medical Officer of Arcelix. In this episode of the Oncozine Brief, we talk about some of the exciting developments in the field of cancer research, in particular in CAR T-cell therapies. Dr. Heary, Chris, welcome to the Oncozine Brief. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Now, before we're going to talk a little bit about the developments that are presented at the annual meeting of the American Society of Hematology, tell me a little bit about yourself, about your background, and how you got here. Sure. Well, I trained as a medical oncologist. My training was, uh, of course, in internal medicine first, and then medical oncology. Uh, I did the medical oncology training at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, Maryland, After finishing that part of the required training, I stayed there at the National Cancer Institute for a total of about seven years. And in in my time there, my primary responsibility was to be the clinical lead of a translational team that was focused almost exclusively on off-the-shelf immunotherapeutics. And so during my time in that role, I saw patients enrolled patients on clinical trials, managed those clinical trials from an administrative standpoint and also a regulatory standpoint, analyzed data, published data, et cetera. And 
most of those studies were in the field of checkpoint inhibition or vaccines or uh, cytokines. But at the NCI, you, you cannot be there and not be aware of Steve Rosenberg's group. So, you know, some of my closest friends worked uh, in, in Dr. Rosenberg's lab. So I was well aware of what was going on in the cell therapy group you know, was a reviewer on protocols, uh, sometimes on the data safety monitoring boards, et cetera. And when I left NCI, I joined a company called Bavarian Nordic as a chief medical officer, which is a vaccine company, but was interested in using vaccines for cancer therapeutics. After that, went to a company called Precision Biosciences, which is primarily focused on gene editing, that they have a, a unique gene editing tool separate from CRISPR-Cas. And we had an allogeneic CAR T platform, so I was I was leading that uh, that CAR T platform, and then about a year and a half ago, was approached by our CEO Rami Elgendor, and he asked if I'd be willing to come and join Arcelix as a chief medical officer. And you know, at the time, I had not heard of Arcelix very much. Uh, I only knew it because I had a former colleague who had who had gone to work at Arcelix, but. I had a chance to review some of the clinical data that would be presented at the the upcoming ASCO meeting at that time, which was in 2021, and it looked incredibly compelling. It's been about a year and a half, a little over a year and a half, and in that time, we've taken what was sort of this early clinical data at Arcelix that looked really compelling and really tried to turn the company from you know an early stage uh, R&D company into a company that was prepared to go into a commercial setting with that product. Uh, so it's been a, a pretty significant change in the company over the last year and a half, uh, largely attributable to some decisions by the board. And that's why they brought in Rami and, that, and then me and then other members of the leadership team. Now, Arcelix is a biotech company focusing on oncology, right? You refer to off-the-shelf products, and these are basically the standard drug therapies that we use right now, in most cases, in the clinic, right? That's right. Yeah. And then with Arcelix, you're actually developing something else, CAR T cell therapies. Now, our audience has often heard about CAR T cell therapies, but tell me in short, what makes these drugs so unique? There's a number of things that are unique about uh, CAR T cell therapies. And, and specifically, when I say CAR T cells, what I mean is autologous CAR T cells that are individually manufactured for each patient. And so what makes it truly unique is that for each patient, we have to remove the immune cells from the patient's blood through a process called apheresis. Those cells are then shipped to a facility where they are modified genetically using a virus, and then they are grown into larger quantities. They are then frozen and then shipped back and then infused back into the patient. So as you can imagine, having a therapy that is individually manufactured for each patient does create some level of complexity that may not be there for historical cancer therapeutics as we, as we think of them broadly. So that is what you're focusing on. And that is also part of what you presented at the annual meeting of the American Society of Hematology, right, in December. Can you tell me a little bit more about these studies and the ongoing research? Because if I understand this correctly, you are presented a number of studies, including the results of a phase two clinical trial and a phase one clinical trial. Tell me a little bit more about these studies and their outcomes. Sure. Yeah. Well, we are we are really only presenting data from the phase one trial, but we have also recently announced that we have begun enrollment of our phase two pivotal trial. So let me yeah let me start with the phase one because that is what led us to everything else. The phase one trial was initially designed to evaluate what is we believe a unique version of autologous CAR T cells. And what is unique about our CAR T cells is the binding domain. So for any listener that isn't aware of what a CAR T cell really is, it is a, a normal T cell that we have modified so that it expresses something that we call a CAR. A CAR is a chimeric antigen receptor. And again, that might not mean anyone to mean anything to someone who doesn't know what that is. So I'll describe it. What that means is that on the external surface, there is something that will bind to something on a tumor cell, and then it is connected to signaling pathways that tell the cell to become active and kill. And we have seen over the last about 15 years, some really remarkable changes in our understanding of these types of cells. 
So starting in about 2009, there were uh, two different groups, one at University of Pennsylvania and one at the National Cancer Institute, who both started clinical trials that turned out to be now approved drugs and are having a huge impact in lymphoma and pediatric ALL. So these therapies are, are really changing the way we think about what we can achieve with uh, cancer therapy. Let's take a break. If you're just joining us, in today's episode of The Ongoing in Brief, I'm talking with Dr. Christopher Heary, the Chief Medical Officer at Arcelix. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Ongoing in Brief. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. And welcome back. This is The Ongoing in Brief. If you're just joining us, in today's episode of The Ongoing in Brief, I'm talking with Dr. Christopher Heary, the Chief Medical Officer at Arcelix. So what we have is just sort of, we think of it as a, a next generation or a, a slight difference in that those original CAR T cells that have already been approved, most of them use a binding domain that is called an SCFV or a single chain variable fragment. And those, those binding domains are sort of, they're based on the antibodies that our, that our body makes normally. What we have done is actually used a binding domain that is based on a synthetic protein. The question might be, why would you do that? And the reason is that the, those certain synthetic proteins have characteristics that um, make them potentially really good as a binding domain. And so in this case, we call this binding domain the D domain. And what makes it really, really nice for this purpose is that it's very, very small and very, very stable. And so what that means is that cells can make it very consistently and at a very high rate. So um, if you just think of a cell as a little protein factory and that all of the functions of that cell are, are the result of how well it can make that protein, they can make D domains very efficiently. And then once they make them, those proteins, the D domains, are actually very, very stable even when they're on the outside of the cell. And so we believe uh, based on what we, you know, the preclinical experiments and what we've seen in the clinic, that D domain based CAR T cells had some potential advantages. And in the clinic so far, in the 38 patients we're presenting, we see very compelling clinical evidence that these cells work really well. So I'll tell you about those now. So 38 patients have been dosed. Every single one of those patients has had a response. About 70% of the patients so far have reached a complete response. And interestingly, when we look at those patients who were dosed 18 months ago or 12 months ago, the complete response rate is actually about 80% in, those, in that group of patients. And the reason for that is very specific to multiple myeloma, but it's something that is fairly consistently seen in, in effective therapeutics in multiple myeloma, which is that the responses tend to deepen with more follow-up in you know, some percentage of patients. So additionally to that, what was um, new at the ASH meeting, because we've presented data on this study before, so what was new at this meeting is we had about seven more patients than we presented at ASCO earlier this year. Um, but we were also able to take a look at the percentage of patients who had not had progression otherwise referred to as the progression-free survival rate at intervals like six months, 12 months, and 18 months. And, you know, there were many people who were wondering whether we would see that a high proportion of patients remained in, in response at 18 months because that is a strong indicator of the durability of these responses. And we were very happy to present that about 65% of patients had uh, progression-free survival, meaning they had not progressed at 18 months in our analysis uh, in this presentation. So the last point that I think is still really important is that in addition to that efficacy data, we also have seen a fairly uh, impressive uh, or unusual, might be a good way to say it, safety profile in that we haven't seen any grade three cytokine release syndrome, uh, which is a, a syndrome that is associated with CAR T cells. 
And typically what happens is people will get high fevers or they can have low blood pressure. We haven't seen any of those grade three events in the dose that we're going to be taking into the phase two trial. And we've had only one event of what's called ICANS or neurotoxicity, where patients will have a syndrome related to cytokines as well, where they can be confused or um, you know unable to answer questions and things like that. So we've only had one of those events out of um, 32 patients dosed at that uh, that dose level that we're taking forward. So taken together, what we believe is that this product has a unique mix of excellent ability to eliminate cancer cells with without the high risk features of historical CAR T cells that might drive some of these uh, toxicities. That definitely sounds very impressive. So congratulations with these results, I must say. Now, this product you have right now in a phase one clinical study, based on the outcomes, you're starting a phase two clinical trial, right? Tell me a little bit more about that. That is exactly right. So we we have actually already initiated a, a phase two trial that will be, we believe, based on our conversations with FDA, that this will be our pivotal trial that should allow us to file a BLA. Uh, a BLA for the, the listeners is essentially the request to get an approval for the drug to be used as a commercial product. And yeah, so th- that study is underway. There are a number of sites coming online, some already are, and we expect to to be enrolling very, very quickly over the next seven to nine months, roughly. A lot of work remains. Now, in other developments, the company recently announced a partnership with Kite. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, one of the things that is difficult, as we mentioned about autologous CAR T-cell therapies, is that there's a very large startup cost to build all the facilities to manufacture at the scale you need to to treat all the patients you would like to treat. And there's no better company at doing that than Kite. So on Friday, we announced, uh, right before the ASH meeting, we announced that we had established a partnership with Kite in which the very, very broad strokes are that Kite was going to essentially take the majority or all, actually all of the of the responsibility related to manufacturing of our product. And in return, they, they gave us some up, upfront money. But I, I think the thing we're really excited about is this remains a partnership. We Both companies have roles and responsibilities, and, and we want to continue to build our Celix as well. Uh, And so this allows us to sort of remove some of the need to continue to raise a lot of money to be able to do the things we want to do. But the other thing it does is it allows us to potentially accelerate all of the development of the program because Kite has so many capabilities in terms of manufacturing and commercialization and distribution channels that we don't now have, we do not have to recreate those. So it's a really an ideal partnership for us, and we're, we're really excited about it. Well, I totally can imagine the excitement. And in that context, I can see how this may help the company. But I can also see that on the long run, and with the manufacturing power of Kite to support you, how patients may benefit from the therapies you're developing, while you, on the other hand, can focus on ongoing drug development. Now, you were at the ASH meeting, where so many interesting study results were presented. Before we're going to talk about that, can you tell me a little bit more about the company's pipeline? What are some of the agents you're advancing through the clinic right now? But also, looking beyond what is being presented at ASH, what are some of the other exciting developments and study outcomes being presented? Sure, yeah. Look, I'll just touch on something that we haven't touched on about our Celix, um before going there, which is that our pipeline right now is filled with another sort of next generation version of autologous CAR T cells. And those uh, products are um, what we would call a universal CAR T cell. And so the idea is that the CAR T cell itself doesn't bind to the tumor target. It binds to a tag on a protein. And then we infuse uh, proteins that have that tag, but also have the binding domain that attaches to the tumor antigen. So you can think of this as sort of like an activation step. We give the patient these cells uh, that we call ARC T cells, and then we infuse these proteins that we call sparks. And uh, so the ARC and the spark have to be present together in order to attach to the tumor cell and cause the cell to be activated and kill. 
And the reason we do that is because there are certain situations where you want to be able to go after multiple targets on a tumor cell. You don't want just one target. And it also, at least in theory, allows us to think about maybe controlling those CAR T cells so that they're not constantly activated, which might improve uh, adverse event profiles, for instance. So there's a lot of reasons why we think this is a really interesting platform. That, that platform went into the clinic earlier this year, and we're actually launching soon another phase one with that platform in AML or MDS. Um, and so that will be targeting CD123. Um, so as we look around the ASH conference, you know, we um, obviously, the leadership team has been very busy uh, finalizing this deal with Kite and a number of other things. But we have, you know, many of our, our people uh, going to the poster halls and things looking for anything related to CAR T cells, of course, anything related to BCMA targeted therapeutics, anything in AML, anything targeting CD123. Etc. You know, and then there are also things that are just of general interest that that we pay attention to. Any, there's always an interest in what's going on in the treatment landscape of multiple myeloma and AML as well. And there, yeah, there are plenty of things to keep track of at this meeting. I assume that more information about your pipeline and the study outcomes presented at Ash and at later meetings can be found on your company's website, right? Of course. Dr. Christopher Heary, thank you so much for being with us here at the Young Christian Brief today. After the break, I'm back with Dr. Serdan Verstovsek. Dr. Verstovsek is a medical oncologist and professor in the Department of Leukemia at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. And we will be talking about some of the developments in the treatment of myeloproliferative neoplasms. Don't go away. Stay tuned. This is the Yonkazine Brief on UK Health Radio, your real feel-good radio with Peter Hofflin. And welcome back. In the second half of the program, I'm talking with Dr. Serdan Verstovsek. Dr. Verstovsek is a medical oncologist and professor in the Department of Leukemia at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, and we'll be talking about some of the developments in the treatment of myeloproliferative neoplasms. Dr. Verstovsek, welcome to the Oncosim Brief. Before we're going to talk about your research, can you tell me a little bit more about myeloproliferative neoplasms? Myeloproliferative neoplasms are a group of diseases of the bone marrow and blood where the cells in the bone marrow grow without control. That's what myeloid stands for, for bone marrow cells proliferative, myeloproliferative, growing without control. And there are uh, several different types. Classic Diseases are essential thrombocytemia, high platelets. That's what me, it means, essential thrombocytemia. And then polycytemia vera is another one where everything grows, red blood cells and white cells and platelets. And the most difficult one is the myelofibrosis. The, the name uh, der is derived by description of the bone marrow, again, myeloid, and then fibrosis, right? Scarring tissue in the bone marrow. So instead of having too many cells, the, most of the patients with myelofibrosis have too few. It's kind of counterintuitive. Uh, anemia is uh, widely uh, recognized as a problem. Some patients have low platelets. And the bone marrow uh, is not working well, leading to a reaction of the body of mild fibrosis patients in terms of enlargement of the spleen, huge spleen, huge liver, bad quality of life, and short life expectancy. While ET and PV are more uh, benign, we call them benign, life expectancy is good, 15, 20 years, 65-year-old, this star average. Uh, age at diagnosis, this is not bad. For myelofibrosis patients, it's five years. So we are preoccupied with that deadly disease. But the therapeutic approaches uh, overlap. While we control the blood cell count because it's too many cells, and that leads to thrombosis in ET and PV, uh, and we worry about the life expectancy in myelofibrosis, there are many medications that overlap and can help all of these groups or some. Now, when you look at this group of diseases, there are a variety of treatment options, some with overlap. But what is the approach? What is the best approach? Chemotherapy, biologics, what is your goal in treatment? Is it your goal to eliminate these diseases completely? Or is it, and it's also a very good option, to control these diseases? So, for example, and to build on uh, standard practice to explain where are the needs, hydroxyurea is a chemotherapy. 
by mouth pill that you give to patients with ET to lower the platelets, decrease the white cells, improve the quality of life in the spleen. These are all f- factors uh, associated with ET and make life uh, uh, less uh, complicated, safer, and decrease the thrombotic risk, blood clot risk, by decreasing those blood counts. Similarly, hydria is used in PV for the same purpose, and in early stage myeloid fibrosis as well. In advanced phase of uh, myeloid fibrosis, it would shrink the spleen perhaps and improve quality of life. So different scope of uh, goal with the same medications in different scenarios. And the scope of work is to control the disease, as you can see, right? We don't have medications that would eliminate disease. A JAK inhibitors, these uh, are medications, again, pills that are given to patients with uh, myeloid fibrosis or PV, sometimes even ET, is another uh, class of drug which is non-specific for a malignant clone. They inhibit the protein inside the bone marrow cells that is important for cell growth, is hyperactive. That's why we call it JAK inhibitors. They are not specific for malignant cells or mutated JAK, so they would decrease the growth, improve the inflammation, and again, useful in ETPV and malfibrosis, but no elimination of the disease. The goal is to control disease signs and symptoms. Right now, when you look at this group of diseases and the standard of care, which may in each case be different, what are the unmet medical needs for these patients? So unmet medical need is to have a medication that would eliminate disease. Makes sense, right? Complete response. You have no disease, there are no issues with blood counts, symptoms, or spleen. Well, plenary session at ASH 2022 gave us a clue about where is the future, what's coming. There was a presentation in our session uh, on the development of an antibody, a protein that would be attaching itself to another protein on the surface of malignant cells in patients with mild fibrosis or ET. Now, how can suddenly that be possible? Well, in about a third of the patients with ET or myeloid fibrosis, they have a mutation in a gene called color reticulin, C-A-L-R. Uh, this is one of the major mutations in these uh, patients. And the mutation in gene makes a protein. The protein gets out of the cells and attaches itself from the outside to the surface of the cells and, and does different things, makes cells grow without control among many. Well, it's on the surface of the cell, so immune system can recognize it, or antibody, a structure that was presented uh, in this or plenary session, can recognize it and attach itself to the surface of these malignant cells and destroy it, or prevent it from functioning, so the cells dies off. That's probably a better description. And so that would be targeted therapy for malignant clone in about a third of the patients with ET and malfibrosis. That's why this was plenary session at ASH, because we don't have anything uh, like that at all. Usually, it's just controlling signs and symptoms, and that's completely different ball game. Like I say, I'm at need of elimination of the disease. Potential exists. It's it was not even a phase one two study. It was just a preclinical, but it's so important it made it to plenary session. Now that's definitely unique. Something that we don't see very often. That outcomes of preclinical development are presented so early in the drugs development at a major medical meeting. It's really something that shows the importance of this development. But what are your expectations at this time? And I realize that this is very hard to predict. Do you expect that this will also result in a faster path to development? I assume that we should expect that this drug candidate will be for the foreseeable future in clinical trials, right? And talking about clinical studies, when do you think these studies will start? I hope the study will open actually in 2023. Now, as you know, Many drugs are being tested. I don't know whether this will work or not. The hope is very high. It will take some time for this to be tested properly. In a third of the patients, it's not for everybody. But uh, what is coming, uh, and it's perhaps more important to talk about right now because it's kind of imminent, is a new medication for patients with myeloid fibrosis called momelotinib. I presented some of the findings on this drug uh, at ASH myself and led the overall uh, developmental program of this drug. This is another pill. It is, again, controlling disease and signs, but much better than anything else so far. Typically, in myeloid fibrosis, we have three problems. You recall the description of the patient's big spleen, not feeling well, anemia. Well, no drug exists so far that will do everything, right? Usually, you uh, have a control of the spleen and symptoms at the expense of worsening anemia, for example. So, you have to find this balance uh, between the benefit and the risk. This particular drug 
has been tested in a phase three randomized study. And now we had presentations of multiple different ones on the, how long the therapy is, how safe it is. It is safe. It's easy to give it, uh, no problems. Uh, simple, safe, and effective, in other words. For control of anemia, symptoms and the spleen, all of it, to a degree possible, of course. And it be may become one of the major new drugs. We expect this to be approved next summer in the United States. May become uh, then readily used because it's safe, effective, and simple. So we are looking forward to that. Now, some additional information for our listeners. Momolotinib is a small molecule oral inhibitor of JAK1 and JAK2. Now, an interesting observation is that patients diagnosed with myelofibrosis had a clinically significant improvement in disease-related symptoms, including anemia and spleen enlargement, when treated with this drug. And this conclusion is based on the outcomes from the International Phase III Momentum trial led by researchers at the University of Texas MD Anser Cancer Center. These findings were published in late January 2023 in The Lancet and support the use of memelotinib over the standard therapy in treatment of myelofibrosis patients that were resilient, refractory, or intolerant to first-line therapy, especially symptomatic patients and those with anemia. This is The Youngers in Brief. If you're just joining us, in today's episode of The Youngers in Brief, I'm talking with Dr. Serden Verstofsack. Dr. Verstofsack is a medical oncologist and professor in the Department of Leukemia at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, and we are talking about some of the developments in the treatment of patients diagnosed with myeloproliferative neoplasms. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngest in Brief. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. And welcome back. This is the Young Cuisine Brief. If you're just joining us in today's episode of the Young Cuisine Brief, I'm talking with Dr. Serden Verstofsack. Dr. Verstofsack is a medical oncologist and professor in the Department of Leukemia at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. One thing that stands out is that momolitinib and most of the drugs that you've mentioned as part of the available treatment options are oral medications. And I wonder, oral therapy introduces a new variable in treatment, that of patient adherence. Because unlike traditional infusion oncology where doctors, nurses and pharmacists directly oversee the dosing of administration of the drug, oral therapy requires the patients themselves to correctly administer the drugs. And various studies have suggested that patients may not always adhere to oral medications. Outcomes of a number of published studies have shown lower rates of oral chemotherapy adherence. These studies suggest more than 50% will adhere to prescribed therapy. However, in some instances, these studies indicate that adherence rates are as low as 16% compared with patients under the supervision of clinicians delivering infusion. And decreased adherence leads to poorer outcomes with an increase in morbidity and mortality. Now, when you look at your patients, the patients that you are treating, are you worried about this? I don't worry about this too much because why do you treat the patients? It's to eliminate the symptoms. And if you don't take the pill, you don't feel well. So the compliance is rather high. It would be extraordinary that uh, medications like momelotinib or other JAK inhibitors that improve the symptoms, not hydria, which is chemotherapy, but others that are JAK inhibitors that decrease the inflammation and proliferation, it would be unusual for people not to take for a week because in a week they feel bad, very bad. The other thing is uh, if we are looking to the future and we potentially have, like with the antibody that I described earlier on, medication that would potentially eliminate disease the compliance is high again, and I'll give you an example in a minute, because if you don't take it, uh, disease is there, you die, you die. I'm sorry, that's harsh, but that's how it is. So there is another myeloproliferative neoplasm that is very rare. It has a complicated name. It's called the myeloid lymphoid neoplasm. It's a combination of uh, lymphoma, ALL, myelo uh, myeloma, or all kinds of uh, clinical presentations like MPN, CMML, but it is uh, caused by a specific abnormality in gene called FGFR, fibroblast growth factor receptor, FGFR. And, and this is a very good case to 
say uh, how much are we uh, advanced in development of new drugs. Very rare condition, but driven by this genetic abnormality, which makes a, a bad protein mutated FGFR. So far, you would die within a year and a half. Now we, uh, in August this year, uh, got approval of FGFR inhibitor, pemigotinib. And that was one of the presentations at ASH, a longer follow-up on patients. In majority of patients, uh, 90 plus percent, you eliminate disease. You don't take the drug, it's not going to go away, right? Or you stop taking the drug, it will come back and your life is short. So there are different uh, reasons why I am not that worried in MPN that uh, people would be not taking pills. So basically, you're dealing with a group of very motivated patients, patients that really want to improve their health-related quality of life and make sure that these therapies, if these therapies can't eliminate disease or cure them, at least can help in controlling disease so that they can continue living. Exactly, exactly. The annual meeting of the American Society of Hematology is being held over many days. In addition to what you're focusing on, are there other interesting studies we need to pay attention to? Well, I'm focused 100% on malaproliferative neoplasms. And one of the major points on several medic uh, presentation was that we should uh, perhaps find a middle ground between controlling the signs and symptoms, how you feel, how big your spleen is, or how is your anemia, and complete remission, which would be elimination of disease, and uh, look at the other benefits which we call a molecular response, decreasing this number of cells, decreasing, perhaps not eliminating, decreasing number of cells that patients are affected by, which transfers to benefits of uh, uh, fewer progressions. Some patients progress to ML, so decreasing progression to acute leukemia or from ETNPV to malofibrosis. So progression-free survival is being built as an endpoint for some therapies through modification of the a mutational profile or a number of cells affected by different mutations. So kind of stepwise uh, advance from just how you feel to, hey, what's your molecular response? Can we prevent progression to maybe with the antibody elimination of the disease? And in each step, in each part of the patient's journey, you are looking at how these developments may contribute to improving their health-related quality of life, right? That's priority, number one. And then you want to have a longevity. My goal is to get the people to feel good and live longer. And with that, thank you so much, Dr. Verstovsek, for joining me today in the Ongus in Brief. I think we've learned a lot about the disease and treatment options, as well as really good news in improving treatment outcomes. Absolutely. We are making strides. This is uh, enhancing our ability to tackle the problem with uh, this disease biology so much so that there will be a number of new therapies within the next five years. So... Thank you very much for having me on the program today. In this episode of the Oncology in Brief, I spoke with Dr. Christopher Heary. Dr. Heary is a board-certified medical oncologist with primary expertise in the translational and clinical development of immune therapies, including, and let me emphasize this, not limited to pdl one inhibitors, therapeutic cancer vaccines, immune suppressor modulators, adoptive NK cells, and many other therapeutics. As the chief medical officer of Arcelix, he is responsible for medical oversight, clinical strategy, medical affairs, and regulatory strategy for the company's pipeline. For more information about the company and what they are developing, go to their website at www.arcelix.com. That is A-R-C-E-L-L-X.com. And I also spoke with Dr. Serden Verstovsek. Dr. Verstovsek is a medical oncologist and professor in the Department of Leukemia at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. And we spoke about some of the developments in the treatment of myeloproliferative neoplasms. For more information about this group of diseases, go to the website of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society at lls.org. Another great resource about this group of diseases with additional disease information, educational information, helpful resources and tips and community activities, as well as opportunities for patients and caregivers to share their stories and spread awareness, go to the website voiceofmpn.com. That is voicesofmpn.com. And if you are a US-based healthcare professional treating patients diagnosed with myeloproliferative neoplasms or MPN, take some time to explore the insights and the expertise from experts at 
mpnconnect.com. For more information about the studies presented in this program, please go to our online journal Oncozine at oncozine.com. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Oncozine Brief. For us here at the Oncozine Brief, we want to thank you, our listeners, sponsors, and advertisers, for your ongoing support. Your support makes it possible that you can hear this program via PRX Public Radio Exchange and in the United Kingdom and mainland Europe via UK Health Radio. And you can also download our program via podcast and streaming media, including iTunes, Spotify, Audible, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and nearly anywhere you can find a podcast. For more information about supporting the Oncuisine Brief, visit our website, Oncuisine, at oncuisine.com. If you're living in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, text the word CANCER to 66866. That is 66866. And we will make sure that you'll receive our newsletter, which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. Thank you all. And thank you for listening. And join us again for our next episode. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngest in Brief. The Oncozine Brief is a global medical educational service from the publishers of Oncozine and ADC Review, the journal of antibody drug conjugates. Support for the Oncozine Brief comes from our commercial underwriters and advertisers and the listeners to this station. For more information about advertising, underwriting, and sponsoring options, visit Oncozine at www.oncozine.com forward slash podcasts. The Oncozine Brief contains health and medicine-related information and is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. The content in this program is not intended as a substitute for professional medical or health advice and does not replace your doctor's advice and guidance. Your doctor is the best person to answer questions about your personal health. If you hear something in this program that doesn't agree with what your doctor has told you, ask him or her about it.